welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and I'm truly delighted to read from the day spring of youth and go over some incredible teachings from the author M. And I spoke about this a little bit in my episode on the devas or dewas or divas, however it's properly pronounced. These books are truly amazing and carry some really powerful secrets about the universe. One of the key elements that the Dayspring of Youth teaches is that there are certain atoms and there's a secret to atoms. And so I wanted to dedicate this episode on the secret of atoms. It is part of the secret behind the law of attraction and so many other things. You attract certain atoms. And he describes the different kinds of atoms and how you breathe them in. And the teaching is really amazing. It's using yoga, but in a different way. He's talking about it on a much larger scale, he or she or whoever wrote it. And there is a discussion of the astral sheath, which is really amazing. So this is going to twist your view of metaphysics in a very unique and powerful way. But clearly when you're done, you know that something came from this, that this came from a higher source. And there's also some links to Walter Russell. Walter Russell spoke of the 2,500 year period between times and there are several synchronicities and coincidences references that are similar to what Walter Russell is talking about. So this is this amazing book that was written a long time ago and it has a very unique and powerful voice to it. And I believe that it's divine from the day spring of youth, the secret of atoms. This work is a record of instruction received during different states of yoga practice that sealed book opened by the aspiring student during his development into his own inner states of being. We have been permitted to reveal this in order that others by similar practice may develop and unfold their inner powers for the body is a storehouse of past, present, and strange though it seems, future records. At the beginning and end of each age, there is a pouring forth of hierarchical cosmic streams of energy. And as they intermittently enter the Earth's atmosphere and unite, we find in this radiation that instruction best fitted for the time. Thus, there is brought to birth a new period of discovery for the world. This new force called by initiates, the day spring of youth, has been in activity for some time, and they who respond to it and practice this Western yoga can enter the new era and become its instrument. This force now working over Western Europe and America possesses a new vitality and energy that will bring about a severance from past and inherited conditions. Minds that respond to it are clarified, and any opposition within the atmosphere of the mental body can no longer imprison them within its rebellious aura, for practice of this yoga attracts an atomic energy of a finer nature and transmutes the consciousness. The great initiates call this the churning of the butter, the separation of the finer elements in man from the coarser. If the student responds to these finer forces, he becomes aware of this manifestation within his physical body and mental atmosphere. For over 50 years, students have been sidetracked regarding the true methods of yoga, for in nearly every book dealing with this subject, they have been told to concentrate inwardly. This is false, as such a concentration attracts atoms of personality and desire. Neither should the word I be used, for this again brings the personal element into play. It is impossible to pass inwardly by direct concentration unless one also aspires. Only through personal contact with a master has a student been taught the true method. Man is a prisoner within the atmosphere of this world, but his higher self awaits the time when he will release himself from bondage and return to it. This union can be accomplished in one's life if the student will but aspire and bring into activity those dormant 
properties of matter within him, of which he has been unaware. Aspiration means that longing for the reality's presence within one's own universe. Real aspiration should be impersonal, for personality attracts atomic intelligences of a personal nature besides parasitical and discarnate entities. Within and about us are highly developed atoms, and in our breathing exercises we attract them into our bodies. They then supply our nervous system with their energies, and as man is the result of his own type of atoms and atmosphere, he is judged by the quality of atoms he attracts, just as he is judged by the kind of people with whom he associates. Man is a solar system in miniature, governed by his innermost that dwells within its sanctuary and seldom manifests beyond its temple. If we are to gain its recognition of our efforts to reach its presence, we must aspire to this inner seat of government. The objective body is not related to its innermost until it can find a means of communication and by attracting atoms possessing the nature of this innermost, we build a bridge between our inner and outer worlds. In this manner, we regain our lost possessions in nature, our true birthright. Before the false dawn came over this earth, those who survived the hurricane and the storm gave praise to the innermost, and to them appeared the heralds of the dawn from the Testament of Learning. Atoms. The purpose of the science of union, or yoga, as it is called in the East, is to acquaint man with his innermost, and this work is but an introduction. The deeper knowledge is only given to the student when he is ready for it. They who teach yoga to the unprepared suffer severe penalties. The fragmentary teachings the great initiates have left us have frequently been appropriated and altered by certain religious bodies who were supposed to have kept them sacred from the time they were given forth. They changed them in order to strengthen their own personal beliefs, and these false transcriptions have plunged the world into darkness. Occultism teaches us that the visible universe is but the lower counterpart of the higher one, which if perceived would give us youth and happiness. All that we see about us is illusory and but a fragment of something greater, for our minds are imprisoned and held subjects to our own illusion world. When we can pierce this, we shall perceive in the depths of nature a mind that directs and guides all things. Many occult schools, especially American, teach us how to develop our inner powers by the improper use of what is known as conscious willpower. These schools say that one's objective self can demand and receive things by impressing the subconscious self through willpower. In the deeper states of yoga, the student directs things, but does not will them as this world understands the term, but uses the consciousness of the reality within him. Thus, in the higher schools, the word will is seldom used. We do not wish to disturb anyone's faith, but we suggest that would man only learn to think inwardly and seek his own kingdom of heaven, he would read therein the original books of the great world teachers that have not been altered for our own books of wisdom are not distorted by the illusion world, as the prophet Muhammad said, to its own book shall every nation be summoned, meaning that in the future man will learn to distinguish the true from the false when he attains union with his innermost. This book also deals with the health of the body and self-analysis and the student can begin these practices no matter how old he is. The body is 
a composite form built up from many sources and periods of past and present experience. In our practices, these are reviewed. The lower centers represent the lower periods of our animal nature and are situated in the lower part of the spine. The centers above the navel represent the more developed states of evolution and consciousness. These lower centers must become our servants, not by conquest but by control. If we fail in this, they will disturb and try to dominate us, thus making us not godlike men but beasts. Life will not be fully understood until we recognize the living forces within us and transplant atoms of a higher nature into the body. This will eventually help humanity to become the personification of justice. Our atomic centers are similar to the starry clusters in the sky, and each atom is a minute intelligence revolving with its own atmosphere. When we aspire, we unite ourselves to atoms that have preceded us in evolution, for they evolve as we evolve, this body being their university, and they prepare the path for us to follow. Different divisions of consciousness or beings intersect man's structure. And when the student enters his interior planes, he will realize that this world is but an illusion and that time and space are different when seen from these divisions. These planes will send their energy into his mind and he will find himself part of a great universal scheme. They who do not squander their time but work for the redemption of their lower natures will eventually enter their own domains and there find the peace of God which passeth all understanding. They will be beyond affliction or pain and in complete harmony with their indwelling consciousness. From these inner domains they will observe that nature's atmosphere teems with intelligences and they will be admitted into worlds of inspiring and radiant beauty creations that will ennoble them for here the hidden glories of the planet are revealed here the elemental sovereigns await to admit them into their territories in this yoga practice the increase of our wavelength responds to these elemental substances and helps us to develop and there we receive the keynote of our characters for these beings are nourished upon the finest forces and wisdom of their worlds and they gladly serve and welcome those who enter their realms of understanding and excellence the problems that confuse us on earth become clear and simple when seen from the interior worlds for there we become the very attributes of truth and from these planes any questions asked are instantly answered according to the experience we have gained in previous incarnations the atmosphere of the mental body is controlled by the atmosphere of this world but by breathing in the energy manifesting in this new age through yoga we can throw off this control by aspiring when breathing we attract the atoms of this new energy into us and slowly conform to their wavelength these atoms bring us a sensation of joy similar to a morning in spring the deeper the student goes, the more he assumes an energy and directness unparalleled in his normal state. He will undergo a complete change and realize as never before the possibilities of his future welfare and how indolent he has hitherto been. When we are correctly related to the atoms of the universe, we can command its powers if the student has no love in his heart, however, he will be unable to attract those atoms that will help him to regain his lost inheritance. Mental effort alone will never unite him to his central universe. Within us reside many atoms that impart their wisdom to our atmosphere in order to hasten their own development. Just as a chemist must know what he is placing in his medicines so must the student acquire the power to analyze any atmosphere. This will teach him at what degree atoms respond, also their type of intelligence and outer appearance. 
Every great master of this science has secretly taught his more advanced pupils how to converse with their own atomic intelligences that have evolved beyond them. Man is the result of his own thoughts and thought environment. In the past, he lived in periods of brightness and splendor and beyond illusion, and he can again contact atoms representing such periods. In this new age, he may once again regain the properties of his lost inheritance, his divine birthright. Once the student regains the power to review his past lives, he can begin to remedy his faults and seek powers lost through selfishness and abuse. When these are regained, he can then evoke in others a similar atomic attainment. We often hear about the return of a world savior, yet are unaware that each man is potentially his own savior and possesses atoms that germinate in his mental atmosphere the qualities of supreme enlightenment. This initiate atom dwells within every living thing as well as within man, but only appears when we have entered the deeper states of our inner worlds. This intelligence is neither named Christ nor Buddha, but is called by a secret sound that possesses the principles of justice. Each center in the body has its own note, and it responds when we sound it. He who sounds the proper vowels the seven vowels of nature harmonizes these centers to respond to a united vowel sound, the true name of his innermost. When the student meditates within his own university, vowels that seemingly travel from a remote past are taught him, for once he knew and understood the true names of things and nature, responding to his call attuned him to her consciousness. Today, we have lost our ancient inheritance, but within the living temple of the innermost, we can regain possession of this godlike science. In the new age, there will come a moment when the sincere student who has attained his inner instruction will accomplish all that has been written about upon his illumined mind body. The dayspring of youth has touched the world in other periods. Where did Greece, whose splendor has never been eclipsed, derive her own wonderful information? From whose school did her architects receive their wisdom knowledge of architecture and the laws of balance, rhythm, and proportion? Who taught Phidias, Praxiteles, and Apelles their knowledge of form, color, and the spirit that permeated their work? Even today the illumined minds feel the vibration that the Praxiteles torso sends forth, and few living sculptors can impregnate marble with such pregnant vitality. Within such masterpieces were placed living atoms that still impress us with reverence and devotion, for they placed within their work their own atoms, and through centuries have passed the sensitive mind can still feel the artist's joy in his creation, yet much of his this rich and manifold creation of Greece arose within the range of 250 years. In the Atlantean Testament of Learning, a book preserved by the brothers, we read the following concerning the origin of the Attic civilization. When the great initiate and his followers of the sun came to the Mediterranean, they halted for a time at the site upon which Athens was later built, and the Atlantean planted in the subsoil atoms that long afterwards stimulated the minds of those who came to dwell there. He then departed with his followers to the fertile valley of the Nile to build up the civilization now called the Egyptian. The developed student will find such records intensely interesting. In the chapter house of the brothers, one can turn over the pages of the past written by the historians of the order. Few people analyze the atmosphere of this world. Neither do they realize their place and part in its activity. They who do so are generally the prophets of a nation and draw upon and express its accumulated store of wisdom. It is this wisdom that unites a nation to its inheritance. Western yoga will help us through many difficult processes 
and give us the wisdom that will enable us to fulfill our missions to this world, as well as to attain to our individual and inner universe. The secret of this form of yoga lies in the breathing in of atoms of a developed nature, for the higher rate of vibration develops our atomic structures. This done by inhaling into the nasal passage a certain type of atom called aspiring atoms. In certain past periods of this world, we could unite ourselves to our inner centers. And today, through constant aspiration and purity of thought, we hope to reach the summit of this attainment and also gather the knowledge the developed atoms possess and bind ourselves to those who reflect our highest aspirations. Only by aspiring for purity can beauty be received. This will also bring us clarity of mind and an instant sense of rest no matter how tired we may have been. Through yoga, the student will receive, besides enlightenment, growth to his spiritual nature and an interior understanding of the scientific world of today. Though the innermost may seldom interest itself in outer things, we should always do so and strive to conform to the laws of this world. Old environments sap the atmospheres of young life. Such conditions are frequently found in old countries, as well as in old cathedral and university towns, for we cannot awaken and train those who will not sever themselves from their old appetites and passions for the culture of a past age. When the student begins to inhale this atomic energy of the new age, it will give him some idea as to his future development, for the old atmosphere of this world has all the dust and filth of many ages, and therefore drags us back to the past. Thus a nation will decay if it fails to respond to its own manifestation of the dayspring of youth. In the past, we ascended the lower densities of matter into the higher, but as we did so, we lost contact, being misled by our lower nature. Therefore, we must not surrender to lower conditions. If we do so, they will enslave us. Men are different in their structures. Some possess dense bodies as well as dense minds and do not respond to any inflow of energy, but drift along in a casual manner. These people are the slaves to other minds and impart such qualities to those below them. In this practice of yoga, we no longer become the prey to other minds, nor revert to old standards of thinking when analyzing the qualities of thought coming from the inner planes. As energy can only be attracted by energy, think of the new energy in the atmosphere when aspiring for these things can only be taken by force. When desirous for certain knowledge, aspire and call upon the innermost to connect you to that center or division responding to that source of information. In the deeper states of this practice, we seek the essence of our past experiences after reviewing our past incarnations, whether good or evil. When we have made the sum total of our experience into a wisdom intelligence, we will then feel, if we are observant when practicing, the attributes of courage and stimulation. This means that through aspiration, we have inhaled those atoms possessing the consciousness belonging to the world of the innermost. We only become aware of our own atomic workers who labor unceasingly upon the growths of our nervous system when entering our interior planes, when we realize we should give them love and encouragement. If we wish to govern ourselves and analyze our conditions, we must pass the barriers separating us from our own sovereignty and this illusion world, for we cannot expect the innermost to promote the growth of our minds until we seek unity with it. Each section of the body belongs to its individual atomic vibration, and we must analyze them in our practice as they collect within the nasal passage. We then call upon those atoms that instruct us, and they will assist us by giving us the quality of balance. As we inhale, a door seems to slowly open within us, and we feel drawn into another sphere. In time, this breathing will be controlled by the innermost. When this occurs, we shall then know for the first time the meaning of rhythmic breathing and sense that other being within us who takes charge and who gives us an alertness and perception never felt before. This is the borderland of our individual universe. Within our nervous system lies a second set of nerves that respond to a greater wavelength. When we aspire, we pass from the first into the second, 
and there collect atoms of a different nature. We also awaken currents of dynamic power that open to the secluded centers and prepare us for admission into our real world of being where atomic substances give us energy and intelligence. In this study, one must take each step with a feeling of security and courage. The illumination that comes to us comes through observation and study of our inner possessions. We are not blind like the mystic who, though radiating great love, has little to demonstrate. For the mystic and yogi of this science are far apart. The mystic, with fasting and praying, weakens his body, seeking to make it subservient to its higher self, of whom he is ignorant, and only its fragrance and peace remain in his heart. But the yogi will develop and learn from his atomic intelligence his own great truth. In this science of this Western yoga, there are preparatory, silent, active, and scholastic periods. These four teach us how our inner and outer bodies operated. The presence of our innermost has to be brought into manifestation on our objective world. Here, we will add an important note about our innermost. Elsewhere, we say that it is held prisoner, but this does not mean that it has no freedom of movement. On the contrary, it manifests through our central system, our secondary system, and objective body, but it cannot manifest beyond these until it is ultimately released through yoga practice. We do not consciously respond to the impressions of our innermost. Though religious teachers say we are in constant union with the reality or God, until the innermost, the instrument of the reality, unites us to it. In our present condition and atmosphere, direct communication with our innermost does not operate until we build into our system its divisions of atomic structures. Yoga teaches us that only through the construction of such vehicles can we receive a response. We do not realize that when we reject these aspiring atoms, we likewise reject our own strength and serenity, or that in our practice, we begin to fertilize our bodies, another type of atom that evokes our hidden forces, just as the gardener uses richer soil to nourish his plants. A devout person often thinks he receives answers to his prayers from his deeper consciousness, for his heart is suddenly aflame, and this convinces him that he has found God. Yet this is but the response of the atomic center within his heart that has registered his appeal an aspiration. He believed this to be an illumination of God, whereas it is but the opening of a center that has attracted aspiring atoms that pour into his system and illuminate his consciousness and pronounce their blessings upon one who has sought their atmosphere. To many, this is called divine revelation. When centers in our secondary system are opened, they also give us similar illuminations and periods of serenity and peace, not the peace of mind as we think, but determined energy personified by our own individuality, that composite body that calls to its innermost. Though we are always observed by the reality and its instrument, the innermost, we are cast out of our own real kingdom until through aspiration we bring into our physical envelope those atoms that respond to the innermost and the reality. How can we know and receive the vibrations of the higher planes without an instrument upon which their vibrations can play and enter its consciousness? Man fails to endow himself with his own higher intelligences and is unaware of their reverence for his innermost. Thus, the reader can now realize that this system of Western yoga is to harmonize us to our finer states of being wherein dwells the presence of the innermost. There are many petals to a rose, but few breathe the perfume of its heart. Therefore seek the innermost, so that its fragrance may sweeten and heal the mind. The Noos Atom In the left ventricle of the heart rests the principal atom. That minute model, the physical body must eventually conform to in its progress. This is a spinning body living within its own atmosphere and is called the master builder for it has charge over all the constructive principles of our physical body like a general in command it has armies of atomic builders and engineers that carry out its directions 
These are the aspiring atoms who seek the innermost as we do. This master builder has its staff of overseers who often sacrifice their own attainments for those beneath them in development. Our first practice is to attract the notice of this master builder or knows atom by the use of these aspiring atoms that attune us to their intelligence. The physical organism is like a foreign country to those willing atoms whose task is to attune it to its greater spiritual possibilities. The master builder rests in the purest blood of the heart in absolute authority over the atoms that obey it. This bloodstream can exert pressure on these workers and thus stimulate them to greater activity. Increased pressure demands greater endurance from them as the body must be repaired regardless of the laborer's desires. These myriad workers whom we neither heed nor help are often discouraged and seemingly hapless through our excesses in stimulants and labor. The student can encourage them every morning by this exercise. Take a deep breath. Stand upon the soles of the feet. Pat the tip of the liver, the Robin Goodfellow of the yogi, and send love and encouragement whilst doing so. The nerve center at this spot is vitalized by our thought and love for there lies the seat of the imagination and a healthy imagination makes a healthy body. These atoms respect an honest mind, for dishonesty in our dealings inflicts disorder in their atmosphere and they avoid us if possible. Thus only pure aspiration can contact us to their consciousness. They also bring the influences of the innermost to our illusioned minds, imprisoned in the mirages of this world. Between man and nature lies a vast void over which few have passed, and many Chinese artists have shown us these great conceptions dealing with the elemental realities that unite the mind to the consciousness of nature. It was the Nous Adam, or Master Builder, that responded to the call of the reality when asked to serve and incarnate into the lower stratas of the world before the coming of the sun to the mind. The physical body only appears solid when viewed from within it looks like a gaseous envelope and is a protective screen for the innermost. Preventing the invasion of foreign germ-like substances, the penetration of our own thoughts can inflict great sufferings upon these atomic, faithful workers within us if these thoughts are intense with hatred, malice, or envy, for these qualities are far more destructive than we realize. Our education teaches us to think outwardly. This prevents our minds from thinking inwardly. What we believe to be our own thoughts do not arise from our innermost and are therefore not of our own individual truth. The Nous Adam will never demand anything that is evil from us. On the contrary, it will suggest only those things that will be helpful for our inner development. Its work is to liberate us from our bondage in this illusion world and as we are the architects of our own fate, it is for us to decide. As the student develops, he contacts those periods when man was enveloped in an atmosphere full of divine wisdom, and he again recalls the plan he had determined to accomplish in this world. We're incarnating a plan forgotten as he descended into the dense matter of this world. In those ancient days, we knew we were composed of atoms possessing different qualities, and we are still encircled by a powerful protective shield into whose consciousness we must again enter. When we receive illumination during our practice, we help our atoms by giving them the same aspiration and aid that we receive. Only when immersed within our interior planes do we realize the pain and misery we cause the workers of the Noah's Adam for we re-experience their sufferings and we determine that in the future we will keep a healthy and normal mind in a clean and healthy body. When the master builder or Nous Adam leaves the body, the body disintegrates. The Nous Adam desires to establish laws that will cause the nations of the world to be as one. Man today is only four-sevenths developed, but when the Nous Adam and its workers respond to our practices, we are taught to stimulate several divisions of the body seemingly atrophied through disuse. The body is composed of two types of atoms, 
good and evil. Through them we are re-experiencing the good and evil of our past lives. Atoms resemble their owners, and those whose atoms are firm and solid have strong bodies. Those with weak atoms have weak bodies. And we enter our intermediate states, we develop our hidden senses of perception, and to become aware of discarnate intelligences, and we must be careful not to confuse our intuitions with their communications. In order to know the differences between the true voice and the false, we should feel a vibration that brings us a sense of victory and stillness, like the end of a great pronouncement. Our inclinations to be alert and healthy will give us the steady reverence of the aspiring atoms. Therefore, we should not eat impure foods and be moderate in our stimulants. Increased blood pressure accounts for abnormal appetites and desires and stimulates our lower natures to greater activities and opposes our entry to our inner worlds. This pressure destroys the nerves that cause the cells of the brain to open and shut as we breathe. These nerves open the cells to the energy passing through the body, and if they are shut through abnormal pressure from sudden exertion, this increases the lower centers to a greater alertness and activity and shuts off the inner worlds from the student and prevents him from receiving their instructions. We must therefore use a method whereby we can shut off the influences of our lower nature. In the heart, there is a small valve that opens and shuts off interruptions from the lower seats of consciousness. Later, we slowly realize that the innermost uses a system of irrigation canals through which flow the beautiful substance that will fertilize our growth and understanding of our own possessions. We not only breathe with our lungs, but every brain cell is furnished with what we analyze as lung passages that collect atoms to impress us with their intelligence. Aspiring atoms are often immersed in substances that destroy their communications with the nose atom, and it is the indolent atoms that bring this to pass. Our minds are collectors of decayed atmospheres of the past filled with the foulness that generates the taste for war and other great vices. In our practice, these decayed conditions will give way to a solar force that will burn them up. This fire will destroy those parasites that have inflicted their burdens upon us and cleanse us for our true minds to manifest. Throughout history, a world savior has appeared at the end or beginning of an age, and when we can read our own inner books of remembrance, we shall then know what illumination each teacher brought to us and to the world, also that they could work miracles through the magical manipulations of vowel sounds, and that their work had been to attune man to the higher vibrations released by these atoms. In every life, we've had the same nose atom and in some lives obeyed its directions. The world thinks that when a man becomes a yogi and goes into retreat, he wastes his life. It is true, he may be known to but a few, yet the genuine yogi has his place in the development of humanity and his power increases as he withdraws from the atmosphere of the world that holds humanity prisoner. He possesses great power and manipulates the thought waves of mankind as the musician manipulates his keyboard. As the student passes through the astral and mental planes in his journey inwards, many of the subnormal beings that crowd these regions, some earthbound, often listen to his thoughts and strive to disturb and distort his mind. The aspiring atoms aid us in bringing to birth the latent energy within us, that sleeping force near our navel center that liberates us from bondage. This force, similar to static electricity, is evoked, directed up the spinal tract, and opens our great hidden centers or schools, for in the central nervous system is the sun intelligence of our miniature universe where man can gain oneness with the reality. We then come under the direction of a most powerful stream of intelligence that helps us to pass out of our bodies and gain information without resorting to normal methods. If we are observant, we can scan the horizon of all endeavors and accustom ourselves to dwell inwardly, regardless of the world's knowledge, and partake of that inner nourishment we outwardly rejected. In our central system, we find certain atoms that represent the consciousness of the great leaders of humanity. These atoms form an atomic structure from whence one will now and again descend into the dense atmospheres of our bodies 
and contact us to those atomic intelligences that have followed their teachings. They will also flash before us the moving screen of our past experiences, and again, there will come over the student what he had previously suffered, feelings of having been conquered and having conquered. He will aim after having witnessed his good and evil deeds to so live. There will no longer dwell within him those atoms that had rebelled against their Lord. No great administrator has ever used the standards of his age. Instead, he has created ideals and used his imagination in order to bring about progressive changes in his civilization. Nations have had periods of enlightenment when the mortal worth of the individual was considered a national asset. The Greeks understood this ideal. The organs of generation are of great importance in these teachings, for their creative power is not for sex alone, but also for the creation of ideal standards through the use of imagination. The powerful energy that enters us has several strands, and each one vibrates a different division of the nervous system. When seen inwardly, these centers radiate different light waves like coals glowing in a dark night. The energy of our central system keeps us awake, but when we sleep it also rests and another form of energy takes its place. This is similar to an engineer overhauling the machinery after the workmen have left, for this energy repairs broken down tissues and destroys all that is of an unhealthy nature. When we awake it ceases functioning and the previous atomic forces resume their tasks. The governing intelligences of each atomic colony resist with all their power any outside influence that attempts to change their attitude towards one another. It is necessary to be always alert for any message coming from the no Saddam, and there is an old hermetic saying, be alert for your master's voice as he is alert for yours. When we can respond to the innermost, we can remedy past ills, live deeper and nobler lives, and become initiated into the lesser mysteries. Destructive Atoms As we have said in the previous chapter, there are two forces within man, good and evil. The nose atom is sometimes called by the occultist the white or good principle of the heart. We will now speak of its opposite, the dark atom, or secret enemy. In many ways, its activities are similar to the Nous Adam, for it has legion of atomic entities under its command, but they are destructive and not constructive. This secret enemy resides in the lower sections of the spine, and its atoms oppose the student's attempts to unite himself to his innermost. The secret enemy has so much power in the atmosphere of this world that they can limit our thoughts and imprison our minds. When we strive to hold the mind to one thing, it will immediately attempt to disintegrate it. As a teacher once told me, if you could hold a pristine thought for but three seconds, you could become a master of the world. These atoms evoke all that is evil within us. And in the history of the world, it has had its periods of power when it becomes greatly destructive. The last war was such a period. As its powers predominate in this world, it is easier for us to contact its schools in our yoga practice for from childhood, we have been taught to think outwardly and not inwardly. It is in the outer bodies that these atoms manifest more easily. Thus, the kingdoms of hell are easily entered. But the kingdoms of heaven can only be entered by force. Here, we think a note upon faith should be of interest. Initiates say that its meaning has been misunderstood. Faith, as the world uses it, possesses no spiritual nature. Though in the secondary system, it means power and energy applied to action. All success in yoga comes from this application, for the true quality of faith is a solar force that illumines the mind and attracts to it atoms of power and energy. More human wrecks have resulted from the misconception of this quality than man realizes. When Jesus used the word in the sentence, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, he meant that one could work miracles if one possessed the atomic energy contained within a mustard seed. But in this world of illusion, this is reversed, and the weak man sits still and believes that all will come to him if he has faith. It is not a force that should only be applied to religious belief. It is the power of the innermost working through the density of our bodies, and the more we respond to it, the greater will be our powers. Incidentally, the student should know that when he enters his secondary system, there is a reversal of things. For instance, here we say the man runs, but in this inner division, the sentence could read, runs the man. 
the secret enemy has never been allowed to enter the higher spheres of our being. In the beginning, when the world was in a fiery state, they refused the call of the Absolute and rebelled against their Lord. Afterwards, they followed the streams of the white atoms and incarnated. Their next opportunity of responding to the call will come to the creation of a new universe. When the student re-experiences those past lives, when he was dominated by evil, he also re-experiences the following lives when he repays such evil through such sufferings. It may help those who suffer much poverty and pain today to know they are paying the penalty of previous actions, for the innermost within them is their judge. When the student can balance his two types of atoms, the white and the black, their powers come under his control, and he can then enter his higher schools. In Eastern terminology, this means he who has attained the middle of his path. He is now under the jurisdiction of neither good nor evil. As we enter the darker spheres of our nature, we meet earthbound intelligences who would attach themselves to us where we permit them. Later, we have to face the composite body of our past evil, a thought form of our own creation, and to whom we have given elements of a soul nature, for unknowingly we are all creators. This called the dweller of the threshold will confront us and is a living dynamic force. Being elemental, it can assume any shape of horror with which it wishes to impress us and usually takes a feminine form. If we permit this evil to gain control over us for but a moment, for it is hypnotic, it will give the nervous system, especially to those uninitiated as to its true nature, a dangerous shock. For if at such a moment we aspire to the reality for protection and understand, it will disintegrate like the ash of a cigarette. When this is destroyed, it will remove the subconscious impressions of fear that children as well as men suffer from in their dreams. In some Greek mysteries, this dweller is evoked and the neophyte is freed from it. There is also its opposite, that we meet on the higher planes, the composite body of our past good and ideals. This is a godlike intelligence, terrible in its appearance of brightness and splendor. It is called the Advocate. We will speak about this in later chapters. We also re-experience our lower schools, our evolution through the animal states, and we discover how they still strongly influence and control man. As this world is closely related to the secret enemy, it is far easier for the student to gain knowledge of the evil side of nature instead of the good, for operative magic deals more easily with the density of matter than the finer forces of nature. The wisdom of the secret enemy is seemingly far greater than the wisdom of the Noah's Adam. As a great prophet once said, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Our atmosphere is moist, and when we attract an evil thought to it, this evil thought will surround us with atoms of a similar nature that will rotate about us like a swarm of bees. On the outer lining of the mental body are nodes of consciousness that attract certain types of good and evil thoughts. Such atoms differ in degrees of intelligence, and some can give us false conceptions of things as well as of people. Students must adapt themselves to their environment and learn to govern their thoughts. By so doing, they can increase their energy and feel a great security and power from the atmosphere of the no Adam. Remember that environments differ and evil places teem with destructive atoms. The innermost judges us by the atmosphere we attract. The sun sends a great cleansing power into the atmosphere. You will notice this in spring when new life and vitality is sensed everywhere, for the atoms of the sun stimulate the central nervous system. It is interesting to note that people infiltrated by the atoms of the secret enemy cannot bear sunlight in the morning when the sun is most vital. Those people who are dominated by their ancestors and live in rooms magnetized by their thoughts also generally prefer seclusion but in the future people will no longer live in the begrimed and congested areas of cities where ancestral atoms of a decayed nature float, for the vibrations of the day springs of youth will separate youth from such hereditary conditions. People who build with old materials should remember that new wine should not be poured into old bottles. Our bodies must build with the new energy and be made healthy and conditions clarified. Each person has an individual atmosphere and an individual intelligence. When we respond to the new energy and clothe ourselves with our own individuality, 
we will have no affinity to other mental atmospheres. This separation will cause students difficulty at first in understanding people, for once on the path we become different in thought as well as in ideas. We are again like little children entering another world surrounded by those pure atoms that came and remained with us in the first years of our birth. And like children, we neither resist nor attract atoms of the secret enemy. In this way, we are protected from evil. Incidentally, it should be known that the opposition to good is the real cause of unhappiness. The worst type of atom that confronts us today comes over from the remote Lemurian period. In this long past age, before this planet had reached a higher level of evolution, our bodies were of an animal nature divorced from its godlike mind and immersed in an atmosphere not unlike the atmosphere of today. We were constantly engaged in war, sacrificed our victims to our gods of destruction, and ate their flesh. Our recreations consisted of opposing animals against one another and eating them afterwards as blood is instantly transformed in the heat of battle into the evil qualities of the combatants. This helped the secret enemy to populate thickly the bodies with its destructive atoms and thus gain greater power over the physical bodies. It was in this Lemurian period that we first broke bread. The more highly developed creatures harvested a grain similar to millet, and this disturbed the animal atoms within them and created a desire to oppose those who followed war and ate the remains and also to unite into a colony of, in brotherhood for the purpose of self-protection. Those who escaped from torture and death also joined them. We were higher than the animals, for we could remember and repeat what we had heard from the elders of this colony. We could easily leave their bodies and had discovered how to receive instruction from another sphere, an overseer globe. At times, there also came beings of a semi-divine nature, whose vibrations interpenetrated and stimulated our bodies. These solar beings taught them an alphabet similar to that of the early Chinese, also a lost art known only to initiates that dealt with the vowel sounds of nature. When these were sounded correctly, they would evoke an audible response, and by the sound the true name of a thing would be known. Our old Lemurian atoms are our most destructive enemies as they still possess the inheritance of their ancient wisdom and the black magicians receive instructions from them. In the ritual of the brothers, we read, Be masters of the black magicians by mastery over their masters of magic. See White Brother by Michael Just. Artists often succumb to the secret enemy and saturate their work with an evil beauty that contracts the beholder with a destructive atmosphere. What thought creates is penetrated by an atomic atmosphere, and beauty is often defiled by the thoughts cast upon it. In the lower spheres, objects of great beauty can be seen, so lovely that we become almost entranced. Yet they would evoke all our evil natures if we permitted them to imprison our minds. In this world, the secret enemy transforms what has been created through great purity of mind into the opposite by the criticism of those darker minds controlled by the secret enemy. The criticism of Keats' poems is such an example. Youthful genius is easily hurt and sometimes destroyed when the dark powers write through the pen of a critic. Every man's past sleeps in the atmosphere of his constructive and destructive atoms. And according to his thoughts, he awakens them and can inflict them upon others. He does not realize he can destroy the healthy radiations of others by the influence of his diseased atoms, for he is not always happy or normal when he evokes his past conditions. Sometimes healthy and positive bodies attract protective types of atoms in order to shield them when in the presence of unhealthy forces. People controlled by the powers of the secret enemy discharge these foul qualities into the atmosphere, and sensitive people are not immune from this if they have not positive minds and the gift of sound bodies. Depression and anger are the two doors through which the influences of the secret enemy enter, and when this occurs, disease germs invade the body. Anxiety and poor food will also destroy our aspiring atoms. Our salvation therefore rests upon the possession of a happy and mentally balanced atmosphere, for our happiness is their happiness, and our miseries theirs also. 
instinct, that power we once possessed when evolving through the protean and animal elements, and which the animal calls upon for direction in moments of danger, still lies within us. And this will awaken again in the middle period of the new age. This power protects and warns us of evil minds, and they who use it will have nothing to fear from the secret enemy, since instinct comes from the innermost and the opposition cannot work against it. If we concentrate intensely upon the secret enemy, we aid it and develop its powers within our atmosphere. Within the lower spheres of our nature, the secret enemy has its schools, and in our practices we are often confronted by one of its servants who promises to grant us any material wish if we will be willing to associate with the powers and principalities of its master. Though should we do so, we must be prepared to give our souls into its possession. This is the student's great trial, for the white atoms do not promise us anything of an earthly nature save a wealth of wisdom and a sense of inner security. Before the great war, those minds responsive to its evil influences shadowed forth its ideal, that might is right, and sowed those seeds of destruction that unlocked the secret enemy within man. The workers of the Noos Adam rebel at any prospect of war or destruction, physically or mentally, and will protect those who surrender themselves to their atmosphere. Atoms of a demoniacal nature are appearing in the upper levels of society, and no nation can secure peace and comfort when their leaders are under such domination. Everyone has a caste mark written upon the forehead, and the initiated can distinguish the character of each man in this matter. Man has several observations posts in his body, and he can see from them into the areas of the world wherein the darker forces are at work. The lordship of a nation passes away, when in the fields the scythes are made to serve the purposes of the few, and the harvest is distributed to profit but a small section of people. The harvest is abundant and can feed all the world, but the atoms of destruction corner the markets and many starve. Humanity is like a feather on a stream, drifting without any real purpose in life beyond that of effacing those disagreeable things that would disturb its pleasure. When in his practice the student enters and peers into the present from a future time, he will see how much agony man could have prevented and the unfertilized fields of the world. Today man must learn to think and become his own savior and not be led by a few minds selected by the secret enemy whom we select for offices of state in the hope that they will gratify our pleasures without any thought of future consequences. The secret enemy works in every way to deny us any intelligence that would illuminate our minds and would seek to stamp man into a machine cursed with similarity and a mind lacking all creative power. The machine-made man's mentality is only molded to serve the machine and the future progress of a race is restricted. For that which is not impregnated with the activity of thought belongs to a world of dead atoms. The machine may make a man useful to others and give him a clean method of living, but it impoverishes him in regard to his own importance as a unit of the great reality. A great dictator has said there is an empty throne in nearly every country in Europe, this is true if people will not think but be led by other minds who assume the powers of dictatorship. The student should know that in the astral sheath surrounding the physical body, this is the coarser envelope of passion and desire. His lower thoughts attract intelligences of an evil nature to its fluidic and translucent substance and there derange the mental body by impressing their thoughts into it, so weaken the character thus assailed. These spirits can foretell many interesting things and give us secret information in order to bind us to them. Though there is little of real worth in such, their astral fluids emit a very disagreeable odor, for they secrete and are nourished upon diseased forms of matter that we throw off. In still lower regions we find forms similar to the lower astral forms, but without their intelligence. These hover over the deathbeds of people and exist upon decaying matter. They are of the vampire species, and the black magicians use these effete substance to direct into the atmosphere of their enemies. 
when we discuss elemental nature, we will speak of how its lower counterpart is permeated with these atoms of destruction, atoms that stimulate ferocity and hatred in animals. In the future, the energy of this new age will inflict upon us a series of mental disorders for these minds that will not respond to its wisdom and power will recoil from it. The secret enemy will have no method of diverting its force, and those who have attracted this new energy will suffer from periods of illusion and depression, but the aspiring student will not be affected. He will be in tune with its vibration and will render it homage and respect. We are still under the spells the magicians of the past have cast over us. The children of the secret enemy speak of their evil works as though they were great virtues. Man easily degenerates when in the power of the secret enemy. It preys upon the burning furnace of his desires, and when he weakens, he is lost, and sometimes cannot regain contact with his innermost for two or three lives, wherein he works out the karma of his evil desires. Our creative forces are made to be preserved and not dissipated, for stored energy is a wealth that can ennoble our characters. Beware the person who fouls his appetite with unhealthy passions and desires. He endangers his own health besides the health of those about him. The secret enemy often gives those who indulge in dissipation greater opportunities to spread their foulness. They then, being more easily directed to perform deeds of evil to which the normal and balanced mind would never succumb. This dark power will, when possible, consume its victims by disease. If it cannot control you when you are poor, but recognizes that you possess qualities that would respond to its direction, it will make you rich, for then you can scatter greater seeds of destruction, and such evil will live generations after. Many who have attained to great power, fame, and reputation have often been stimulated and work under its authority. In order to collect their instruments, the schools of the black magicians make sex worship one of their principal teachings. The advocate previously mentioned is an atom of great intelligence that always stands in the presence of the reality. And if we are serious and faithful in our aspirations for union with our innermost, after we have entered our secondary system and re-experienced our past, it pleads that we should be forgiven our past misdeeds. When this happens, a man is reborn. This advocate is a great shield of protection for the sincere student, but if we desire, it will permit us to work for the secret enemy. If we do so, we cannot come under its protection in this life. We alone must choose our paths, the right or the left, the good or the evil. One note on the astral sheath. Man has brought over the astral sheath from a remote past, and like the fetus in its early stages, it represents man's past submerged worlds of consciousness. If the student immerses himself in its atomic structures, it will revert him to his lower passions and desires. It is through yoga practice that we free ourselves from its domination. Its several strands are entwined into one cord attached near the navel. Gravity affects it, and its greater densities are collected into a sac-like formation that extends below the feet. The atomic intelligence of this sac possesses a knowledge of good and evil forbidden to man and represents man's lower elemental and animal past. This has been symbolized in Genesis as the tree of knowledge that grew the forbidden fruit of good and evil, and is this that the black magician contacts. But such intercourse will retard the student's entrance into the atmosphere for several incarnations. The Egyptian magicians used this knowledge to perform their great miracles. It is one of the teachings of the brothers that this sack should be sloughed off and thus give the adept power to levitate and prevent him from ever being earthbound or revert to past periods. We have shown only the main strands from these numerous others branch out. The astral body is a pattern body or matrix upon which man's physical framework is constructed. It is most akin to the physical body and registers its emotions and desires. It has several node points that intersect into the mental planes and this produces annoying astral conditions. For the developed mental atoms have contact with the lower astral atoms and thus the mind receives messages from astral intelligences. Each principal nerve ganglia of the coarser nervous system has an atomic link with the fibers of the astral sheath and when the student removes the astral framework from any part of his body, that part will not register any pain. 
This is easily demonstrated in hypnotic control and an initiate can use this method if tortured. See also the meditation by Frank Rudolph Young on using the mind navel where this technique is further elaborated. Breathing and bloodstream. We do not realize that we inhale distinct kinds of air and that the physical body is a highly sensitive magnet to the alternate day and night currents of the earth. We attract atoms with distinct characteristics. Similar natures attract similar atoms. And we know not that when thinking we attract atoms that sheath us in their vibration. We also inhale a dust of decomposing matter whose organisms would greatly disturb us if seen under a microscope. That inflicts our worker atoms with their diseases as well as sins. The kind of food we eat also attracts similar conditions that can impoverish and make our bloodstream impure and thus prevent us from responding to the higher vibration that the current of the life force pours into us. The pure blood of a yogi enables him to attract pure atoms and give him an energy that impure blood would reject. This is why a healthy body as well as healthy mental and physical environment are important. Decayed substances that infest the blood must be eradicated ere the inner seats of government can be opened. Many people do not care what they eat and drink or how ill-ventilated are the rooms in which they live. They should immediately alter such habits when they take up this practice. When we analyze the atmosphere in this world after we return from a mental flight, we find that it possesses a most disagreeable and fetid quality, particularly over congested areas, and I have often wondered how these beings of splendor and light must feel when they visit the student and sense this unhealthy smoke and atmosphere. Sometimes when a student is mentally traveling with a teacher to a place in order to prevent something occurring there, he is asked to analyze the odor, for by distinguishing the odor he can tell what kind of disease infests the spot. The air we breathe on a clear frosty night is full of atoms that charge the atmosphere with vitality and power, and a long walk in the snow clears the system of germs foreign to the body. Winter sports teach us the value of this, for these atoms quickly gather and absorb the moisture wherein atoms of a lower nature are collected and give them strength and vitality. It is necessary to prepare our minds for purity of thought and action. When aspiring, sit still, breathe normally for this kind of thought, and so attract atoms with such qualities. When thinking, we breathe in atoms of the nature of our thought, and our blood is an exact replica of these. In the future, scientists will measure and weigh our thoughts. Also discover the nature and energy that direct our bloodstream. A normal bloodstream represents the activity of a normal mind. Though often it is inflicted with disease and worry, we can discern within a person's atmosphere the exact nature of the energy in his bloodstream and can systematize it when registering the radiations of his mental aura. Scientists have discovered many different properties in the blood but have not yet measured the atomic substances that enable the bloodstream to operate under the guidance of the nose atom. This atom's atmosphere will in time be located by them, as yet we cannot measure it by mechanical means, nor observe the nose atom spinning in its center. The blood determines our growth and inner relationship. When we analyze this by radiation, we find that no two people are similar and that the particles of matter in the aura give us the keynote of the student's real worth. When a student is inwardly related, he carries an atmosphere that even the insensitive mind recognizes for its cleanliness and can clairvoyantly tell a person's position in nature by the brilliance of his aura. This clairvoyance is considered abnormal by the world, but this can easily be developed by one whose mind is clean and seeks purity of thought and action. One with this gift can give it to another who is in harmony with him. When he energizes his third eye, the vibration from it enters the left ventricle of his heart. And here the nose atom perceives these waves, seeks to discover what has called it to the objective mind. As it analyzes the seeker's thoughts and aspiration, it sends its atoms to the pineal gland to develop it. Thus, the atom is the real instrument that can awaken an atrophied center. We again feel it necessary to remind the student about his physical development as this is one of the secrets of the yoga, also that he should become united to his master Adam and increase his power of breathing into his system 
those more highly developed atoms, which then become overseers to the atoms that build up the physical body. As anatomists know, the purest blood is sent directly to the seminal tract, but they do not know that it is directed by the nous atom. Yet the best blood is impure compared with the blood of a yogi, though normal blood is slowly changing into a higher vibration. We have often heard the term blue-blooded aristocracy. To the occultist, this means too much inbreeding and dissipation has brought impurities into the ancestral blood and weakened its constitution. When the solar force is evoked, our blood has qualities of sunlight and vigor and in time will resemble a clear stream of life-bringing energy. When we enter our secondary system, our arterial bloodstream pressure increases. That is, as we breathe our aspiring atoms, they force the blood into areas hitherto unaffected, and these respond by building up their structures. The normal man cannot do this as the yogi does, who intensifies the pressure when practicing and unites the solar and lunar currents into one energy. This gives the mind thoughtful impressions of a deep nature and destroys sluggish currents. The blood cells become vital in order to supply these newly opened territories of the body. This develops the physical body into another state of consciousness in that it is impelled to assume a more direct positive energy and promote the growth of its lower dominant nature. This change in the blood takes place the moment we have brought a sufficient number of aspiring atoms into the body. This change is not physical but of an atomic and gaseous nature that adheres to the walls of the arteries and energizes the blood. The transformation atom directs this energy into weak nerve cells and brings life to them. This is how the bloodstream assists us. It opens our principal centers and eradicates impurities. Atomic pressure within the bloodstream does not mean an increased pressure within the arteries but an increase of energy among the atoms, and this greater energy eradicates the destructive forces within the body. We have now spoken about the inhaling of certain atoms. In the atmosphere are numerous kinds of atoms that distract and injure the mind. If we can live in the country away from the congested areas, we breathe fresh air and healthy atoms and open a number of nodes of consciousness that were closed when we lived in the city. These nodes sense the country conditions and relate us to its rural nature, but the opening of such nodes depends upon the receptivity of the person to nature. Our mental screens are impregnated with atoms of past civilizations, and though we think of them as dead and buried, yet within these screens these atoms will still contact us to those civilizations that are now far in advance of our own. And the student can contact their golden ages of culture and intelligence, civilizations that will take this world many centuries to achieve. For example, although Egypt is considered but a remnant of an ancient glory, in the inner plains we can still enter her periods of illumination and wisdom and discover what the world can gain from such a consciousness. The student should always remember that space-time is non-existent on the inner plains, that everything is. Thus, he will learn that within him are the atoms representing higher developments than his. But when he enters his secondary system, he will find it difficult at first to discriminate between his own instructor atoms and those of a foreign nature attracted to his mental screen. These atoms also attract intelligences of other civilizations. These foreign atoms and entities are injurious to our screen, for they do not represent the student's past experience and wisdom. If we attract the past, it is apt to becloud and retard our own growth for we must develop from within and not from without, no matter how highly evolved is the period. In the student's later progress, he will easily rid himself from any outside interference by radiating his own solar force. A torn mental screen brings disease and often insanity, for in this wound hordes of atoms and entities find a place to build their structures. And in some desperate cases, we have found several colonies adhering to the envelope, in this manner, they can speak into the mind of the subject and the normal personality is often replaced by others. These severe cases can be healed by proper care and judgment by the doctor, but he must be able to locate the cause and not judge it objectively. The coming century will produce a new school that will deal with such cases successfully and a mind harassed by such conditions will greatly benefit if the patient can live in a very high altitude. 
for such atoms and entities cannot rise owing to their density and weight. In the East, those instructed in certain systems in yoga are taken into retreat far above sea level, for a clear atmosphere enables the student to enter his secondary system more easily. Incense properly used could drive away lower conditions from the screen and cause a number of node points to become active for the odor will attract different atoms that will clarify the atmosphere. The mental screen is often bent from its normal shape if the tissues of the body are destroyed and will appear like an elongated balloon and when the body is unable to radiate into the mental screen, a hollow depression is seen. This tells the developed student what organ is diseased. A sudden fall or shock can sometimes injure a membrane of the screen and some period will elapse ere it will return to its normal shape. We have frequently met people whose auras were out of shape so we knew that all was not well with their physical bodies. A normal and healthy body has a normal and healthy screen. If we have foul minds we are not physically healthy. Aspiration and inward seeking will engender our atoms with a healthy appetite for they are fed upon the higher nature of one seminal fluid. This is the energy we have brought over from past lives and provides us with great energy similar to the seminal fluid. We should remember that if we procreate children, we bequeath to them the strength of our past, and this inheritance gives them stamina and courage. The two qualities with which weakness is bequeathed are weak in their powers of observation and endurance. Mental distortions are caused as we have said previously by the silken linings of the membrane being inflicted by the diseased germs of the secret enemy. In this silken web project, unprotected node points and germinating fluids collecting about them produce erosion. This hampers their receptivity when registering thoughts and distorts them in the physical brain. When we are healthy, the node points are strong. In some cases, these nodes have been shattered by shell shock which also produces distorted imagination and great mental sufferings. This is one of the great penalties of war and few realize how such cases suffer. From year to year the thought waves about us are increasing and this pressure upon humanity brings an ever increasing agitation to our sensitive minds. It is by aspiration that we protect ourselves from this thought bombardment. Hence it is imperative to erect a protective shield about these node points. This bombardment is caused by man's uncontrolled thought agitation that will later return and inflict him with certain forms of mental disorders. The rapid voltage of the dayspring of youth will add to this state of mind. War also loosened conditions that seek to destroy the healthy mind. When we wish to close down the node points to the illusion thought of this world and open them to a higher note, we use this method, we aspire and multitudes of dormant node points will suddenly open as we go inward to receive information. Our normal node points will then close down thus shut out the thoughts of the physical world. This is the method that helps us to receive instruction from our interior centers. When we can shut out the objective plane and the organs that receive its impressions, we shall be able to exist for certain periods of time within our self-developed universe, for there we can find and possess an interior set of sensory organs that relate us to the activities of our inner systems. A higher voltage within our atmospheric sheath is caused when we enter our secondary system, and this removes the accumulation and mental debris we have collected. When the student has combined nature's consciousness with his own energized, the latent node points of his mental sheath, he then commences his deeper education. As he proceeds inwardly, he brings into activity more and more node points of his atmospheric sheath. When he has attained this illumination, he possesses a consciousness that the physical brain responds to and registers the inner waves of thought, as well as the teachings from distant stars. The cell life in us also rejoices when we begin to water their parched soil, for we had not considered their efforts of labor or supplying us with a habitation for their innermost who is our guide as well as our savior. When breathing excessively through exhaustion, we collect atoms of the most disagreeable nature. We should bear this in mind while exercising for such atoms are of the secret enemy. And elderly people often asphyxiate themselves with this energy when breathing them into an exhausted body. These traveling to the generative organs inflict them with diseased atoms that can at times cause instantaneous death. 
The protective screen grid of nature has broken down, and we thus breathe a distinct type of death atom that will irrigate the system with their corrupting substances and cause diseases suddenly to spring up. When we breathe normally, we do not exhale all the air from our lungs, and this remaining carbon dioxide gas ultimately produces death. Year in and year out, we have been infiltrating our bodies with this carbon dioxide gas. We leave about a hundred cubic inches of this deadly gas in our lungs. For when we inhale, we use three times the muscular energy than when we exhale. Only when we can develop our breathing muscles to a higher degree as the yogi does can we keep our lungs pure. By careful exercise, we learn to breathe outwardly. When this becomes a habit, our body will be greatly refreshed and our mind atmosphere cleared of its debris in order to destroy the attraction our lungs and nasal passages have for these atoms we learn to inhale atoms of a more advanced nature for in their higher vibratory current they destroy this poisonous gas that is the cause of an old age we learn to breathe from the lower regions of the abdomen so that the muscles and walls of our lungs become elastic and powerful it becomes second nature with us, for we must exhale these impurities with force insects do. This will then teach the student what wonderful activity goes on in his body. He will sense the activity of the divisions and analyze them. When he has perfected his body into a finer instrument, the nose atom will take this breathing over. We have written about this elsewhere. Later in this practice, the student will learn to retain his breath, its higher counterpart, magnetic oxygen, the real vital breath, and pass this through his stomach into his abdomen. The atoms there will also receive a higher vibration and assist him to awaken his solar force and a trance state of bliss. And that is The Secret of Atoms by M from The Day Spring of Youth. And so make of it what you will. You can replace the word atoms with vibration or frequency or energy or whatever you want. But it sounds more accurate to me than when we're attracting ideas and thoughts. They're atoms, the tiniest possible quantum bit that you can think of. That's why we're dealing with the quantum field. The quantum field is made up of atoms. And so there is such an abundance. We're talking about trillions, trillions and trillions of these atoms that we're breathing in and to become discerning of what we bring in with food, water, and air. Those are the atoms that come and define us. And within those atoms, it's powerful. It's also good to understand that the energy centers in our body are not the nerve ganglia that we have in our body. It is the atom that is, you can't find it if you were to do an MRI or do an x-ray. You're not going to find it if you do and you take apart the body. You're not going to find the atom. The atom is an intelligence. We are living with multiple intelligence in our body that are working together. The nose atom is who we are and has been with us from the very beginning. They don't necessarily say it is us, but has been with us. And so it is very much like reality transurfing in that we are the heart mind coordination and understanding our heart communicating with our heart that's the no saddle within our heart that's what that's talking about that is how we can affect outer intention and so i thought that this was amazing it's interesting to think about that we have both good or evil atoms working within our body destructive and elements at the same time as creative elements and it gives me a way to visualize it and understand it a little bit better and to understand the importance of my breathing and what I'm taking into my body. I thought you might find it powerful and interesting. Perhaps it awakens some thought you had in your past incarnations or future incarnations. In any case, let me know what you think. Have you ever heard of this interpretation of energy? Uh, have you read any more of the Dayspring of Youth? Tell me your thoughts of M. And if you'd like future readings from M, I promise we will definitely bring that. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. <laughs>